Hi, my name is Dr. Nikki Cooley. I'm going to talk to you today about the effect of water management on warm climate grapevines. I'm going to specifically look at vine water use and carbohydrate partitioning. This is part of the vine physiology and grape production subject, which is offered in the Viticulture and Enology degree at North Melbourne Institute of TAFE. For more information on our educational packages, please visit www.nmit.edu.au. My name is Dr. Nikki Cooley. In this lecture, I will start by giving a background of canopy water status, vine carbohydrate partitioning, large vine canopy, canopy ma management practices, and irrigation management practices. This will be followed by an outline of some experimentation I conducted. <coughs> the results of this experimentation will be presented in the, top, in the areas of plant water status and carbohydrate partitioning. I will end this lecture with some reflections on integrated management outcomes. The grapevine research presented here was conducted as part of the Cooperative Research Centre for Viticulture. I would like to acknowledge the suite of people that were involved in this research. The researchers conducting the data I'm presenting include Mr. Peter Klingleffer, Dr. Reb Walker and Dr. Anne Pellegrino. I'd also like to acknowledge Wingara Wine Group, which was the commercial vineyard where this research was conducted and the support staff there, Justin McPhee, Jeff Marne and Craig Thornton. I'd also like to acknowledge the technical support, Melissa Craig, Rachel Hanlon, Sonia Needs and Damian Watson. And finally, for their valid input, Dr Rachel Ashley and Dr Paul Petrie. The data that I'm going to show you in this presentation was funded by the GWRDC and the work was conducted at CSIRO in the laboratories in Merbing. So what do we mean by warm climates? Well, one such example of a warm climate district is the Mali district. This has a latitude of 34.24 south and a longitude of 142.09 east and is based on the borders of Victoria and New South Wales. It has an elevation of 50 metres above sea level. Typical temperatures tend to be warm. For example, the January mean max temperature is 32.2, while the minimum is 16.7. The mean temperature in the morning at 9 a.m. for this region over a year is about 15 degrees, and this jumps up to 22 degrees in January. The afternoon, or 3 p.m. temperature for this region, averages across the year at 23 degrees, and in January jumps up to 21 degrees. The mean sunshine hours averages across the year at 8.6, while in January is 10. There is not much cloud in this region. There is about 107 days a year of cloud. The mean rainfall is low at 290.6 millimetres across the year, of which 45 days of this the rain falls in less than one millimeter, therefore is unaffected. The humidity across this region at 3 p.m. averages about 39% and drops to a low 27% in January. The characteristics of these vines are that they tend to be mechanically hedged. They can tend to be large. Their phenology starts with bud burst around September this is followed by flowering in November. Veraison occurs around January, February time, and harvest is usually in early March, although these dates do, do differ by several weeks depending on the variety. Along with the large canopies are associated large yields. The quality of wine ranges in this area. It can be as low as $12 a bottle and up to about $20 to $25 a bottle for the Australian domestic market. A large proportion of this area's wine is exported to such countries as the UK.
This climate impacts significantly on vine water movement. The basics you will all be familiar with. Water is usually taken up through the roots, transferred or translocated through the trunk and escapes or is driven out of the leaves. I like the word driven rather than escape because it is actually the climatic components or impacts that determine how much water tends to be lost in a grapevine. This is referred to as the evaporative transpirational demand, or ET demand for short. In warm climates, ET is very important. It influences the stomata behaviour and the xylem pressure. Water is lost through the leaves in large amounts in these areas if water is available to be lost. Fruit development stage, typically veraison, occurs in January in this region and during this important developmental time the vines are subjected to hot, low humidity, long sunshine hours and low rainfall, where the only water source is typically irrigation. So what is this process of evaporative transpiration, or ET? Well, it's the components of certain climate inputs, and these include the wind, the humidity, the radiation, and the temperature. In warm climates, the ET demand tends to be high. The Sunraysia region has hot, low humidity, and variable wind speeds. Water moves from the roots through the trunk and out through the leaves. As stated in the previous slide, this area has a high evaporative demand. This means that this water movement, where water is available, tends to be of a rapid nature. In the trunk, xylem vessel elements allow the movement of water. Sometimes issues such as cavitation can result. This can be a problem and is seen sometimes in some rager, particularly under the high evaporative demand. The soil in the area tends to be a sandy loam with a low water holding capacity. Irrigations are not long in nature but frequent. This is due also to the fact that there is a calcium carbonate layer that tends to occur between 1 and 1.2 metres although this does vary across the region. This calcium carbonate layer acts as a barrier and the roots are unable to penetrate it and search deeper for buried water. Agricultural water management in these areas includes irrigation on both large and small scales across farms, the drainage of irrigated and rained areas, watershed restoration and recycling of water also rainwater harvesting, although this is quite low in this area. In the Sumraja region, the irrigation is largely off the Murray-Darling Basin system, with either permanent or temporary licences, and this offers the farmer a range of water securities from high to uncertain, although in low rainfall years, the water security tends to be dependent upon the actual supply which results in uncertain security. Typical irrigation in the summer months will last between three, four to six hours. And typically, most irrigators will start their irrigations late in the evening and finish early in the morning, usually aiming to stop before seven. Dripper spacing can vary, but in the experimentation I conducted was 0.6 metres at a dripper outlet before. The wetting zone was about 50 centimetres and again is typical in this kind of management structure. This slide follows the route of water movement through the plant. You can see water absorption through the root hairs. This usually occurs at the tips of these hairs. Then via a water concentration gradient water moves through the xylem vessels. 
Water is then taken up into the phylum, xylem, into the stem. It is then translocated into the petiole, where it diffuses through to the lamina. Here, water is lost via the stomata out to the atmosphere due to the transpirational demand, and so the cycle continues. Crops have different requirements or demand for water at different developmental stages. For example, their water requirement at bud break is quite small, while their water requirement around veraison is much higher. A crop factor can give you an indication of the water requirement for grapevines. On the slide you will see several crop factors for grapevines at certain important physiological stages. You can adjust your irrigation amount by multiplying your crop factor. This will give you the actual amount that the plant requires. It is worth noting that water requirements will also depend on your climatic conditions, that is your wind, your temperature, your pressure, and your evaporative transpiration, and your humidity. Crops have different water requirements depending on the market that they will end up in. For example, a grapevine which is grown for the wine industry high premium quality will have a different water requirement to a, a grapevine that is grown for a table grape. This area tends to attract high cropping management and that coupled with the climate component results in certain vine physiological aspects worth noting. Many of these vines, if they're not spur prune, tend to have large leaf surface areas particularly those that are pruned by a mechanical mechanism. The large surface area of the canopy results in high transpiration or stomatal conductant rates where adequate water allows. This results in medium to high photosynthetic rates. You tend to have long sunshine hours coupled with warm climates and if enough water is present and nutrients, you tend to get high photosynthetic rates over a long period. The sum of this results in a large carbohydrate pool at the vine's dispersal. This pruning allowing typically results in high yields. There are several components that are required for optimal production of vine carbohydrates. The first is carbon dioxide, an important component. It is worth noting that most species evolved under a carbon dioxide level of 240 parts per million. However, today's carbon dioxide levels is much higher. A website, co2now.org, is a website based in Australia that will give you the current CO2 levels. The 395 level was the mean for <clears throat> August in 2013. This is considerably higher than the CO2 level that plants, including grapevines, evolved under. Water is an important input for vine carbohydrate production. Typically in warm climate regions, irrigation can range from about 3 to 8 megalitres per hectare. Sunlight is also an important component for carbohydrate production. In warm climates in Australia, sunlight hours tend to be quite long, ranging between 6 and 10 hours. And finally, adequate in <coughs> nutritional requirements are, are needed for vines. These include NPK. There are some areas which are predominantly sandy in nature that may be borant deficient and this needs to be considered occasionally for quality components. When talking about carbohydrates, you will often hear the term sources and sinks, and they describe the functional use of the carbohydrate. A source is where a carbohydrate is being supplied. This can be either from within the vine or 
a source of carbohydrates can be produced via photosynthesis. Sinks are where energy is stored in the vine. This energy is stored in the form of a chemical energy, which you know as carbohydrates. It is important to realise that different strategies are <clears throat> undertaken by different types of plants. The carbohydrate partitioning and requirement of source sinks for an annual plant, for example, such as a vegetable, is quite different to that of a grapevine, which is a perennial. So let us have a quick look at carbohydrate partitioning. This is the movement of carbohydrates across the vine and through different storage organs. Let's start with the leaf. This is usually, but not always, a source of carbohydrates. During the photosynthetic light reaction, energy is captured from the sun and converted into chemical energy in the form of the compound 3PG. Two of these compounds are coupled together to form the carbohydrate that we know as glucose. This is a six carbon sugar and a simple sugar. When two of these glucose molecules are joined together, they form the molecule sucrose. Sucrose is a very important carbohydrate for the grapevine, as this tends to be the compound that is translocated or moved around the vine most often. So, once leaf carbohydrates are formed, glucose is changed into sucrose and sucrose moves into the stem and then the trunk. Sucrose can then enter the grapes if this is the right phenological stage. The grapes are a sink. Sucrose can be cleaved back into glucose or fructose or mannitol. If the sucrose compound does not go into the grape or there is not a requirement for the grape, it can continue its journey down the stem and or trunk. There are incidences where glucose will form, will join, sucrose will join many molecules of sucrose together to form the compound starch in the amyoplast and so Storage carbohydrates or starch may be laid down in the trunk. If this does not occur, the sucrose can continue its journey down to the roots. Again, sucrose molecules can be joined together, forming long chains of starch molecules. Sucrose <clears throat> is formed into starch and stored. If the plant requires to use its stored carbohydrates, for example directly after bud burst, then starch is reformed into sucrose where it can then be translocated or moved back up to the organ of requirement, in this case the leaf. This slide summarises the discussion in the previous slide. <clears throat> So in the canopy, leaf photosynthesis fixes source carbohydrates in the form of glucose, which it then converts to sucrose to transport. Leaves can be a sink, and this happens at periods when the leaf is very small and early on in its development, or at stages such as bud bursts. Carbohydrates can be translocated into the grapes, and here they are a sink. Carbohydrates can move up and down the trunk or they can become a sink. Roots can contain sink and source carbohydrates. This depends on the functional use of the carbohydrate at the time the question is asked. I am sure you are all familiar with the phrase stored reserves. What this actually refers to are the sink carbohydrates in the grapevine. Vines require reserves until producing enough energy. This is usually three to six weeks post bud burst, but this will depend on the climate, the region and the variety. 
they will get these reserves from the roots and or the trunks, but predominantly from the roots. Vines are perennial in nature and their reserves are dependent on the net photosynthesis and the competition between sinks. When you have a vine with a high crop road load, there is a potential to delay ripening. And this is a consequence of carbohydrate partitioning. Adequate available water is required for a good carbohydrate production. One of the most common forms of carbohydrates is starch. And this is usually discussed or presented in the literature as a as a percent dry weight basis of the plant material. The starch concentration in the roots, for example, will vary between 7 and 25%. After pruning, vines can retain about 30% of the total assimilated carbon from the previous season. Approximately 9% of all stored carbon over the winter time is then utilised to support the new shoots in the following season. And this sums up the perennial nature of carbohydrates in grapevines. The image on the slide shows typical warm climate vines. You will notice the large canopy area of these vines. So far in this lecture I have introduced some of the basic concept concepts around plant water use and carbohydrate partitioning. In order for us to understand the impacts of water management on warm climate, high cropping viticulture, I'm going to present a series of results from experimentation that I conducted. <clears throat> this research was funded by the GWRDC as part of the CRCV and conducted at CSIRO Mobile Laboratories. The field component of the experiments was completed on a commercial vineyard, Wingara, Wingara Wine Group, on the red variety Cabernet Sauvignon, own rootstock, eight years old, that were mechanically pruned in a hedge style and pruned to about 60 buds. The soil was a sandy loam with poor water holding capacity, where care needs to be taken with respect to both nutrient and salt management. Irrigation was set by approximate vine requirements based on per periodic soil moisture measurement via neutron probes and then modified to fit pumping vineyards requirements. Therefore, optimal ET requirements in the control or standard treatment were not obtained. Disease prevention was undertaken, predominantly by spraying regularly about every 14 days with the compound sulphur. These experiments were conducted in the Sunraysia region, which is the Mali district in Victoria. Three irrigation treatments were applied, a control or standard irrigation, an RDI, that is a regulated deficit irrigation, and a prolonged deficit irrigation. An RDI irrigation, a regulated deficit irrigation, is an irrigation strategy where you impose a water stress for a certain time after flowering. It is important to get the timing right as the aim of this water stress is to reduce both cell division and cell elongation on early berry development. This water stress can also constrict canopy growth which can be an advantageous depending on your vine requirements. The prolonged deficit or PD treatment was an extreme treatment. This began as an RDI treatment and delivered in the same way. After the RDI treatment was finished an extended period of no water was applied until veraison. The graphs on the slide show the three irrigation stresses. You will note that there is some irrigation stress during the RDI and PD period and an extreme irrigation or water stress as shown by soil moisture in the PD treatment for each of these years. The season 2002 to 2003 climatically was quite different from 03 
and 05. It was hot, it was very dry, and water supplies were limiting as we were in the middle of the drought. When conducting experiments in, <clears throat> in irrigation, one of the most important components that you can measure of a vine is its water potential. In order to fully understand water potential, you must understand some physical and chemical properties of water. For example, one of these properties can be seen when you place a straw into a drink. The water will move up the straw in a capillary type action. These concepts will not be covered in detail in this lecture, but they will be covered in the plant physiology subject, which is offered as part of this degree. For the purpose of this presentation, I will give just an overview here. So water potential is the measurement of the water potential or tension of the leaf surface. This is important because it explains characteristics as well as the amount of water in the leaf. Leaf water potential in a fully hydrated leaf is nominally or normally zero bar. Water potential can have several units, bars, micropascals or kilopascals. <clears throat> one bar represents 0 0.1 megapascals, which is equivalent to one kilogram per centimeter squared. As the leaf surface suff suffers a water stress, the leaf water potential increases and much more pressure is required to pull the water from the leaf. Typically, leaf water potential measurements are in negative units. It is very important to remember this. They are not positive, they are negative. The illustration on the slide summarises this. Water potential is shown from 0 to minus 60. The arrows in indicate increasing water deficits or stresses. For water to move from the soil into the roots of a plant, the root water potential must be lower than that of the soil water potential. There are three factors which influence water potential. The concentration of the solution, the pressure and gravity. Water moves along a gradient from lower water potential to higher water potential. So from less negative water potential to more negative water potential. This may sound confusing at first, but if you look at the following image and you follow the water potential becoming more negative, it will begin to make more sense. Start at the roots. This is usually an area with water. We are talking in this situation of a well-watered vine where the air is at 22 degrees C and the relative humidity is at 50%. You will see that the soil water potential is minus 0 0.5 bars. This is close to zero. As the water enters into the roots, the water potential has become more negative at minus two bars. As you continue up the vine, the water potential in the stem is minus five bars, while in the leaf is minus 15, and the air is minus 100 bars. It is this relationship that aids in the movement of water through plants. In summary, for water to move from the leaf to the atmosphere, the water potential of the atmosphere must be lower or more negative than the leaf water potential. Water has many roles in plant growth and development. It is required for the production of chemical energy as it is required in the light reaction where it is split and both hydrogen, both hydrogen ions are used and oxygen is released into the roots. It is required for complex carbohydrates, cell division, cell expansion and optimal growth. The following image on the slide shows you that different water potential measurements 
represent different processes or stresses for different plants. What does this mean? You will all have grown or tried to grow, I'm sure, a vegetable and you will note how much water vegetables tend to require. While if you were to grow a cactus, they are quite different and require a lot less water. The water potential in the soil of cactus plants needs to be more negative than the water potential of vegetable plants. And this is the concept illustrated in this slide. In order to fully understand water potential, there are a number of concepts that you have to realise. Firstly, is water potential fluctuates over any 24 hour period. There are periods in grapevines, which are C3 plants, when the vine is actively opening its stomata with high transpiration or water loss rates. At these times, the water potential will be more negative. While there are other periods during the 24 hour period, such as in the evening or before dawn, when no water movement is occurring in the grapevine. Here, the water potential will be less negative. This, of course, will, be de will depend on how water stressed the grapevine is. Pre-dawn leaf water potentials are often used as the standard. This is because it's presumed that the grapevine is at equilibrium at the pre-dawn period. While midday water potential not only represents the cell turgidity but also the transpirational rates of that vine. This can range from negative 1.2 to negative 1.4 megapascals or negative 12 to negative 14 bar. This of course depends on many things. Different vines will have different water potentials and different stresses will impact this response differently. So what is the effect of implementing a water stress on leaf water potential? Well, there are a number of things to consider. Firstly, the time of day. In the image on the slide, a figure is shown demonstrating leaf water potential measurements taken on standard vines or control vines and compared with water deficit vines. You will note that the scale starts from minus 400 kilopascals to minus 1200 kilopascals. The more negative the reading, the more stress the vines are at. Water potential does reduce as the day progresses. This is because transpirational demand increases as the day progresses. That is, there is more light and energy available to the plant to conduct photosynthesis. If it's conducting high rates of photosynthesis, it requires large amounts of carbon dioxide. Therefore, stomata will be open as long as the water source is not limiting. You will notice that the water deficit vines have a more negative water potential, that is the line is below that of the standard vines. This tends to mean that stomata have closed up and there is a higher, a, a more negative or stressed water potential. When you measure water potential during the daytime, you are measuring the combination of transpiration and turga in the leaves. So in summary, water deficit vines have a more negative leaf water potential. Water potential indicates that the water deficit vines in this situation are conserving water. Water potential is an important monitor as it can give you an indication of plant water stress. It is also very useful to the industry. 
instruments to measure leaf water potential are commercially available and they are often used on many commercial vineyards. Interpretation of the data is relatively easy compared to some other measurements. The measurements are manual in nature, however technologies are moving very fast and it is probably an only a matter of time before you are able to automate such measurements. Experiments were conducted during this trial to determine what was causing the reductions or more negative leaf water potential in the plant stress. Leaf turgidity or turga was measured as well as leaf osm osmotic potential. I will not go into the theory here of these measurements or why they are important. But please take home the message, reductions to leaf water potential were due to reductions in leaf turgidity and not osmotic potential in this experiment in this situation. The second measurement conducted on the water stress vines in these experimentation was stomata conductance. So how does water stress impact on stomata conductance? <coughs> In order for us to understand this, we should first understand what the values represent. Zero represents closed stomata, or no stomatal conductance. When the plant is at zero, it means there is no water loose, use, loss, sorry, but conversely, there is no carbon dioxide entering the plant, so photosynthesis is either limited or has stopped. As the stomatal conductance increases, so does the opening. Therefore, the rate of carbon dioxide entry also increases, <coughs> but the water loss increases too. Therefore, if you have very high conductance, you will have vine stress if there is no water available to the plant. <coughs> if you have very high conductance and water is available to the plant, the plant tends not to be under stress, although you de <coughs> do need to be mindful of cavitation. With very low stomata conductance, if there is no water available to the vine, it is moderating water loss. This is good from a water conservation perspective, <coughs> but not option optimal from a photosynthetic or carbohydrate production perspective. If water is available to the vine and there is low stomatal conductance, there is no need to conserve water and you are reducing your photosynthesis rates, which again lowers your carbohydrate production. So you need to look at these results in the context of both the water stress and what you are trying to obtain from a management perspective. The figure on the slide shows the observations of water stress on stomatal conductance in our grapevines. The standard or controlled vines had a much higher stomatal conductance than the water deficit vines. The reduced stomatal conductance observed in the water deficit vines was seen or observed throughout the period of the day. So in conclusion, water stress can reduce stomatal conductance. This can mean two things for the plant. One, that it reduces water loss. And this is a good thing if your vines are under a water stress. Two, it can reduce carbon dioxide intake. This is a negative consequence of, of, of reducing stomatal conductance. If you reduce your carbon dioxide intake, then you have less carbon dioxide for the light reaction in photosynthesis. Therefore, you will theoretically fix less carbon and produce less carbohydrates. The mode of action of a reduction to stomatal conductance can be two components. It can be a response to the climate, that is the evaporative transpiration or demand as discussed previously, or it can be as a response to reduce available water in the root zone. In this situation, I suspect that both were playing a role in the reduced stomatal conduction. Measurements were taken on several days, although only one day is shown in this data set. 
reduced available water and reduced tomato conductance were mode of action and response seen on all of these days. So to conclude, stomato conductance would appear to be a very good indicator of plant vine res uh, stress or response to climatic conditions. However, stomato conductance measurements on a commercial scale is not yet possible or viable. Another measurement collected in this experimentation was leaf transpiration. Leaf transpiration is the movement of water. When transpiration rates are high, large volumes of water are lost. When transpiration rates are low, smaller volumes of water are lost. The unit of measurement of transpiration is micromoles sorry, millimoles per meter squared per second. In these experimentations, grapevines exposed to water stress had a significantly reduced transpirational rate, which was observed throughout the day. So in conclusion, water stress can reduce leaf transpiration. There are several possible modes of action for reductions in leaf transpiration. One is that there is a physiological response by the vine to reduce stomatal conductance, which in turn reduces transpiration. Or two, there is a climatic response, a change in evaporative transpiration demand, which is not suitable for transpiration to occur. Transpiration theoretically would make an ideal stress indicator as it is a direct measurement of your water movement. However, to date, there is not a piece of equipment that is commercially available that can readily and cheaply measure transpiration rates across grapevines. Transpiration has a cooling effect on the grapevine. This, in turn, can change the canopy temperature. In this experimentation, measurements of leaf temperature were collected throughout the day. We observed from our results that control canopy temperatures started off at about 24 degrees C and rose throughout the day to about 29 degrees C. Our extreme water stress treatment started the temperature off at the same point as the controls. However, these vines were much hotter, particularly towards midday and towards the end of the day. Therefore, water stress can cause increased canopy temperature. This is a result of reductions to transpiration. Therefore, the cooling effect of transpiration is no longer impacting on the vine. There are instrumentations becoming available that can readily measure canopy temperatures across large areas. These are based on infrared. These sensors show great potential for a commercial stress indicator. However, there is much work to be done in this area before these sensors are commercially available and before their information can be readily transcribed or used across many varieties in many different climates. Leaf photosynthesis is the measurement of the ability of the plant to undergo the light reaction, which is the first stage in the production of energy in plants. Photosynthesis is measured in micromoles per meter squared per second. The higher this value, the more photosynthesis, photosynthesis is occurring. Photosynthesis is also referred to in some literature as assimilation rate. The graph on the slide shows the data that was collected between our control or standard vines and our water stressed vines. The controls vines photosynthetic rate was reasonably high, starting off at about 18 micromoles per meter squared and 
reaching about 21 micromoles per meter squared. These high photosynthetic rates are typical of these vines in these areas when adequate water is supplied to them. But as you can observe from the prolonged deficit treatments, that is the lower line on the graph, significant impacts on leaf photosynthesis occurred. These impacts were seen at midday, but also across the entire day. And this is important because this represents a long-term issue in carbohydrate accumulation. If this observation is true and observed throughout much of the season. So in summary, water stress can reduce photosynthesis. If an extended water stress Photosynthesis is reduced throughout the day. Reduced photosynthesis can impact on carbohydrate produ production. The measurement of photosynthesis is again a very good stress indicator. However, currently there is no commercial sensor available. The cost of collecting photosynthetic measurements is very high, time consuming, and requires a certain level of expertise in order to obtain this data. From this graph we can see how the reduced photosynthesis has indeed led to a reduction in the production of starch in the leaf. Starch concentration in this experiment was determined on a percent fresh weight basis. The top line or solid line shows the control vines. The dashed line shows the prolonged deficit vines. You can see throughout most of the day there is a significant reduction in leaf starch concentration. <coughs> Therefore, water stress reduces leaf starch production throughout the day. The mode of action for this is probably reduced photosynthesis. There is not a commercially available indicator for leaf starch concentration. However, there are areas of research that are looking at light absorption, transmission and reflection. And at certain wavelengths, the light absorption, transmission and reflection may correlate with certain sugars. The research is continuing in this avenue and it may, we may see in the future a commercial sensor that can tell us what our sugar concentration is in both our leaves and our berries. In the observations we have made so far in this experiment, we have looked at the effects of water deficit compared to a commercial standard vine and how these effects have changed across a 24 hour period. If we wish to look at a more integrative effect and look at the effect of carbohydrates over a season, one of the recommended and standard techniques is to measure the trunk carbohydrates. The trunk carbohydrates contain both soluble and starch carbohydrates. They are a snapshot of the storage carbohydrates. You have to remember that there are storages in the leaves, in the berries and in the roots potentially. But they are a good relative indicator of stress. Again, they cannot be used as a commercial indicator to date as there is no sensor commercially available. Trunk starch carbohydrates need to be obtained by sampling and taking these samples to an analytical laboratory where they are processed and observations determined on specific machines. Trunk sugars or carbohydrates do change over the season depending on the sink demand and the source production. The figure on the slide demonstrates three soluble carbohydrates that were measured during this experiment across the season. The first sugar or carbohydrate to be measured was sucrose, then glucose and then fructose. 
You will note when you look at the control responses, which are the solid lines of these graphs, that there is quite a considerable seasonal variation, and this is typical. However, experimentation also shows that most carbohydrates measured, sucrose, glucose and fructose, also changed during the periods of applied water deficit. During the season 2003, this was the first year of the experiment and hot and dry, sucrose concentration was significantly higher in the water stress during the period of prolonged deficit water stress compared to that of the standard. While no differences in sucrose concentration were found during season 2004 between the standard and the water stress. This result was found in season 2005. Both seasons 2004 and 2005 were not as hot and had more cloudy days. Significant variation in trunk glucose and fructose was also found with each season. The prolonged deficit or water stress treatment altered glucose and fructose concentrations significantly they increased during the water stress period in season 2003, while no significant pattern was observed during most sampling times in all seasons. Total soluble carbohydrates and total carbohydrates, which are not shown on this graph, were significantly high in 2003 compared to 2004 and 5, thus resulting from higher concentrations of starch and all soluble carbohydrates measured. So what does this all mean? I have presented this data to show you the complexity about the effects of water stress and soluble carbohydrates in grapevines. This response has been seen many times in the literature and what it suggests are that there are com uh, complexes in this response and this indeed is the take home message. You will not have to remember for this lecture all the integral effects between sucrose, glucose and fructose over the years, but rather that there are complexities. The data on this graph is trunk carbohydrate analysis of the sucrose, glucose and fructose, which was totaled. This shows that the timing of measurement is critical. If you are going to use carbohydrate partitioning and the measurement of it to determine your vine management, you must ensure that if you are comparing seasons, that you compare the same time of year. The table on this slide shows the impacts of carbohydrates at different measurement times. The first measurement time was a pre-water stress and there is no significant difference between the treatments as you'd expect. During the water stress both irrigation treatments or water stress treatments had a reduced carbohydrate content. After the water stress only the most extreme water stress continued to exert a significant reduction in carbohydrates. By the time harvest had come there was no significant impact on trunk carbohydrates. While at leaf full, which is an accumulation of the effects across the season, there was a significant impact of extreme water deficit on carbohydrates found in the trunk. This, you may think, is a concerning observation. As a reduced trunk carbohydrates at the beginning, at the end of the year, will mean that at bud bursts, these vines will have less carbohydrates. An interesting observation made during these experimentations that several years of the prolonged deficit or extreme water stress resulted in smaller canopies. It is almost like the vine is self-regulating itself. So to summarise these findings, irrigation stress indicators can include photosynthesis, tomato conductance, transpiration rate, leaf water potential and leaf turga. 
but in a commercial situation the most optimal to use currently available is leaf water potential. The observed effects of this experimentation was that the seasons had greater stress during season 2003 than either 2004 and 2005. Thus there is an interaction between the water stress and the climate. It can be seen that on hot days leaf temperature was significantly increased. This is probably indicating a physiological stress for the grapevines. During the stress period, trunk carbohydrates had a reduced starch concentration. Reductions in sucrose were observed with an extreme water deficit at Verazin, and an increase in sucrose with the prolonged deficit treatment was observed at harvest. Most importantly, soluble carbohydrates are very fluc uh, flu fluctuate greatly with respect to season and there is some complicated interactions between climate, season and water deficit. I will end this lecture with the following slides looking at management outcomes for such observations that have been presented here in this talk. Central to management of vines in the vineyard is dependent on understanding the manner in which grapevines use the available resources to grow and reproduce. Canopy management. In order to obtain optimal canopy management, you need to ensure optimal canopy area. This is important to make sure that you have enough resources for your system. Excessive canopies can result in negative consequences such as more money for water inputs, more money for nutrient inputs, the potential for more disease, particularly in the bunch, and more bunch shading, and this can lead to alter berry composition, which can lead to a reduced quality of your product. It should also be noted that in warm climates, changing available water needs to be conducted with great care. High evaporative transpiration demands can result in additional issues. You can overcome this problem with accurate monitoring. This would ideally include a combination of sensors, such as soil moisture monitoring and one or two plant water status monitoring. Currently water potential or leaf temperature, which is often used or in which is often recorded as crop water stress index, are also good measurements for plant water status or stress. Hence, an integrated management practice needs to be implement implemented in order to obtain the optimal economic outcome for your vines and your wine product. Available water can be used to manage canopy size and berry size when aiming for optimal composition characteristics. You can alter water, canopy area, berry size. This will have impacts on vine physiology, water use, transpiration and stomatal conductance, photosynthesis, total carbohydrates, carbohydrate partitioning and berry composition. Water can impact on other management inputs such as vine health and disease, susceptibility, nutrient requirements, yield and profitability. Therefore, integrated management is required in order to obtain the optimal economic return. The following is a list of references that may help you understand this topic and some of the research uh, observations presented here. So in summary, vine management in warm climate regions is a compromise between carbohydrate production, evaporative transpiration demand, available water and yield. Vines can adapt to water stress provided leaf area reductions result. To optimize your system, monitoring plant stress is essential. Plant water potential is a useful indicator of vine stress and can be conducted in commercial vineyards. Measurement of soil water is also recommended when you are managing warm climate 
large canopy vines, you are managing for a compromise. And that is the take home message of this lecture. This brings us to the end of this lecture.